Good afternoon and welcome to today's Georgetown Alumni Webinar, hosted by the Georgetown University Alumni Association and Georgetown Health Magazine. Thank you for taking time out of your day to connect virtually with fellow Hoyas for today's program, the microbiome and gut health in the time of COVID-19. Our moderator for today's conversation, Douglas Varner, is the Assistant Dean for Information Management at Dahlgren Memorial Library, the Graduate Health and Life Sciences Research Library at the Georgetown University Medical Center. His research interests include quantitative and qualitative assessment of the library value to institutional research and educational endeavors and library participation in systematic and scoping reviews. I'm Kelly Young, Associate Director of Strategic Engagement and Alumni Relations, and I'll be facilitating today's program. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few tips and reminders. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available on our YouTube channel. You will receive a link to the recording in our follow-up email. The group will answer questions towards the end of, end of their discussion. Please send in your questions using the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. If you're having any technical difficulties or other issues, please also submit those concerns via the questions section of your control panel. Without further ado, I'm pleased to turn things over to Douglas Varner. Thank you very much, Kelly. And on behalf of myself and the panelists, we'd like to extend our thanks to the co-hosts for this session, Georgetown Health Magazine and the Georgetown University Alumni Association for sponsoring this event. And thanks also to all of you for logging in and listening in for what will be an informative session. I would now like to introduce our distinguished panel panelists for the session today. Dr. Robin Chutkin is an integrative gastroenterologist and the best-selling author of Gut Bliss, The Microbiome Solution, and the bloat cure. Educated at Yale and Columbia, she's been on the faculty at Georgetown Hospital since 1997 and is the founder of the Digestive Center for Wellness. Her educational platform, gutbliss.com, provides evidence-based digestive wellness advice. An avid squash player and yogi, she is passionate about introducing more dirt, sweat, and vegetables into people's lives. Dr. Kate Michelle, he is an assistant professor in the School of Medicine at Georgetown University and a KL2 scholar at the Georgetown Howard University's Center for Clinical and Translational Sciences. Her work focuses on the role of the vaginal microbiome in the context of HIV progression, cervical cancer, and reproductive health, as well as projects on the impact of physician healthcare systems trust on antiretroviral use and the geospatial analysis of preterm and low-term birth weight births in Washington, D.C. Dr. Sona Wasudevan is a faculty member in the Department of Biochemistry at Georgetown University Medical Center. She directs the MD, MS, dual, deg dual degree program in systems medicine, a freestanding and a freestanding master's program in systems medicine. Because the systems medicine program at Georgetown is the first of its kind in the world, she has played an important role internationally and domestically in establishing systems medicine as an important component of medical education. Her research interests include taking a systems medicine approach to the study of inflammatory bowel disease, cancer, and drug repurposing. And with that, we'll, we'll get started with our panel discussion. First question goes to Dr. Michelle. Could you describe what the microbiome is and the role of the microbiome in health and disease? Hi, great, yeah. Um, so I think first um, I'll just go with a definition of microbe. Um, it's a microscopic organism, uh, but it includes bacteria, fungi, proteins, viruses, et cetera. Um, but we'll mostly focus on bacteria. Um, and I, I'd like to frame this kind of in, in terms of some key introductory questions um, that I kind of put together as part of the, the course that Sona started uh, that kind of sprouted uh, this collaboration, uh, the clinical applications of the microbiota. Um, and first, uh, let's talk about how many cells are there in our microbiome? Um, as a raw count, there are more bacterial cells in your body than there are your own human cells. Um, although by mass, of course, there are far fewer, 
Um, and a 2010 study estimated that these bacteria may have about 150 times more genetic potential kind of within their pan genome than our own human pan genome or all the potential human genes that we have. It's pretty interesting. Um, and where are most of our microbes located in our bodies? Um, now, you'll, you'll hear a lot about the gut microbiome, and for good reason. Um, the majority of all of our microbes are in the large and small intestines. Um, a decent fraction are in our stomachs. Um, however, we also have a very high concentration uh, in our mouths and on our skin. Um, but long story short, there are very few places we don't have microbes, um, and even places we previously thought of as completely sterile, um, like the uterus um, or, or bladder, uh, now seem to have, uh, you know, bacteria occurring. Uh, what types of mo microbes do we have? Um, well, it's estimated that our gut microbiome is over 99% bacteria, uh, so this is why you see Basically, we focus on bacteria, um, and a lot more analyses using uh, 16S rRNA sequencing, which is specific for bacteria. Um, however, of course, increasing research is focusing on the less than 1% that's not bacteria. Uh, I think it's also interesting that there are many different types of bacteria across each body site. Um, so each body niche has typically one to two signature, signature bacterial phylas that make up around 20 to 80 percent of the total habitat, which is pretty interesting. So, for example, in the nose, you'll have more um, acinobacteria uh, are very more dominant and nearly absent from stool and vagina, um, but the vaginal microbiota is almost, you know, completely firmicutes. Uh, so, kind of interesting that there's, there's little microbiomes within our microbiome. <laughs> Uh, so what factors shape our microbiomes? Um, and I think this is really exemplified um, by a 2018 study that found that diet, drugs that we take, and body measurements accounted for about 20% of the interperson variability in the gut microbiome. And interestingly, they also found that non-related people living in the same household were more similar in their gut microbiome than relatives who lived in different places. Um, and interestingly, outcomes like glucose levels or obesity were better predicted by gut microbiome composition than by genetics or environmental factors. Um, so it's, it's very interesting that the gut microbiome, and this is kind of borne out in other studies as well, is highly shaped by diet, uh, uh, antibiotics or drugs we take, um, and the places that we live. Uh, and finally, why do we have microbiomes? Um, and I think just in a sentence, I think the thought is just, it helps us break down food and get nutrients from our food, vitamins, uh, uh, you know, uh, break down products of fiber, um, and that's probably why the majority are in our GI tract. Um, but we'll discuss a lot more here, some of the more wide-ranging health effects. Um, and we also know there's extensive crosstalk between our immune cells and microbiome. Uh, and you'll notice that the main places our microbes are located that I mentioned is kind of in these external places. So whether that's the skin or mucosal surfaces like the GI tract. Um, so these are places of defense um, and that kind of makes sense. So yeah, a brief, brief introduction. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. <clears throat> what do you think is the role of the microbiome in the era of systems medicine and big data? Um, that's a great question, Doug. And if I were in person, I would be asking show of hands, how many of you have actually heard of what systems medicine is? Um, so I'm going to start off by defining what systems medicine is and what uh, contributes to the era that we are in, which is uh, era of big data. So systems medicine is a very novel approach um, to medicine and is based on uh, computer models uh, that uses vast amount of uh, clinical data and uh, that is used for analyzing uh, the health of individual patients. It's a multidisciplinary field uh, and it looks um, and treats individuals as a whole and uses omic technologies. So data generated from all of these different omic technologies, and I'm sure that you all have heard of so many of these omics, uh, like genomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, I can go on and on for an whole hour about all the omics that's out there. Um, so that all this data from all of these has actually put us in the era of big data. Uh, now, and this, um, has also opened doors to the possibility of using these omics to personalize a medicine or treating uh, patients uh, precisely or the precision medicine. Of course, the dimensionality and uh, the scope of all of this has increased multifold uh, 
uh, with the sequencing of the human microbiome. And so now in the last several years, in the last decade, in fact, we have also started realizing the role and the importance of uh, microbiome itself uh, and the role it plays in health and diseases. Um, just to bring this whole uh, con uh, the whole context in, uh, and make it relevant to what we're all going through uh, in the era of COVID right now, uh, there's been a couple of papers where they've actually shown that there's a correlation between the changes in the lung microbiota and the outcomes of the COVID patients. Um, and they've also shown that uh, bacteriotherapy has actually helped. And this is a study from Italy. And I would, um, I'm going to reserve the actual uh, description and the discussion of this to Dr. Chutkin. Um, and so now I just want to conclude with one sentence by saying that uh, the whole microbiome has actually opened up the next generation of medicine um, and added to the whole omics layers. Um, and so microbiome is going to become very integral and important um, more um, than ever before. Thank you very much, Dr. Pasudevan. <clears throat> Dr. Chutkin, how does genetics, the environment, and medications contribute to the composition of the microbiome and disease expression? Thanks for that question. We had a little preview from Dr. Vasudevan's answer. And Basically, epigenetic factors are factors that are not coded in the DNA that can still affect the outcome in terms of disease expression. So if we think of the microbiome, the microbiome is a really key epigenetic factor, along with other things like environmental exposure and the host immune system that can really decide whether something is expressed or not. We know a lot about these epigenetic factors from twin studies. So for example, if we look at identical twins, with diseases like inflammatory bowel disease. We know that there's not 100% concordance because frequently both of the twins do not have inflammatory bowel disease. So this is where other factors like the diet, environmental exposures, et cetera. In fact, in inflammatory bowel disease, genetic factors, meaning what's actually coded in the DNA, only explains a disease in about 20 to 25%. And we know that in the rest, one of the really significant factors is alterations to the microbiome in childhood. There's a meta-analysis from Mount Sinai a few years ago that showed that early exposure to antibiotics in childhood is a major risk factor and can have an epigenetic effect in terms of determining whether that child develops inflammatory bowel disease or not. So it's not just whether you have not the nod to gene on chromosome 16 or several other of the associated loci, it's really what happens to you during that progression from birth to disease expression, these different epigenetic factors. Our first link between epigenetics and a disease state came with cancer in the early 1980s, linking colorectal cancer to loss of methylation in the tissue, which is one of the ways, in addition to uh, affecting histones and RNA silencing, methylation is one of the ways that genes can be altered and that can lead to mutations. And they found in that first patient that there was loss of methylation in the colon cancer tissue compared to other disease-free tissues in the same patient. And that was affecting tumor expression. So it's really important to think about these different factors. And quite frankly, it's really a message of optimism because it's not this idea that your genes are your destiny. There are many other factors that can control and contribute to whether disease is expressed. And the good news is that many of them, like diet, are within our control. Thank you very much, Dr. Chutkin. <clears throat> Dr. Michelle, in addition to epigen epigenetic factors, what other, what other factors affect disease expression? Um, so I think there's a lot of concepts to talk about uh, in terms of COVID disease expression. Um, we have to, I think, consider who's going to be most at risk of acquiring the disease um, and then factors that it can, you know, uh, affect uh, symptoms and as well as, as well as severity of symptoms and uh, outcomes like, like passing away like death. Um, in terms of who's at risk for acquiring uh, COVID-19, um, we have some evidence just from epidemiological studies. Um, but I, you know, I should say too that we're, this is obviously a new disease. We are learning more all the time. Um, and, you know, so kind of that asterisk on everything. Um, uh, we do, you know, it does seem that older folks are at higher risk. Um, younger folks are generally at lower risk. Uh, 
Um, there's evidence that this might relate to ACE2 expression. Um, ACE2 is the receptor, um, which is essentially kind of like a, a marker on the outside of cells um, that's able to interact uh, kind of with the environment and do some sensing. Um, and, uh, you know, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 binds to ACE2 to allow the virus to get into our cells. Um, a few studies have shown that ACE2 expression um, in the nose and in the blood increases with age. Um, so you might have uh, more susceptibility uh, uh, with older age. Um, but older folks also have uh, more health conditions. Um, and we know from ep epidemiological studies as well that um, conditions like diabetes or hypertension may play a role in kind of exacerbating disease expression uh, and susceptibility. Um, I, I think uh, some epi studies have also found some differences by sex. Um, this may also relate to ACE2 expression. Um, however, I think I'd have to defer to Catherine Sandberg at Georgetown who knows a whole lot more about this area than I do. Um, uh, but um, in terms of disease expression across the body as well, I think ACE2 can um, play a role there as well. It's highly, expre highly expressed in the lung, um, but it can be found uh, to some extent in a lot of other body organs, particularly uh, heart, liver, kidney, intestines, um, that might explain to some extent the wide range of organs and, and symptoms that can be found with COVID-19. Um, specifically, um, ACE2 is highly expressed on um, small intestine, uh, lower levels in the colon or large intestine, um, and it has its own function there. ACE2 it acts as a co-receptor for, for nutrient uptake and uh, amino acid absorption from food. Um, and there, there might be some association with polymorphisms of ACE2 as well. Um, so I think there's still a lot, a lot more to, to understand about this. But. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. What are the common routes of infection for COVID? Um, yeah, so we all know uh, that um, COVID-19 is a respiratory illness and that can spread from person to person. Um, and transmission of this virus um, can occur through direct or close contact with the infected patient. So the virus might mainly spreads through respiratory, uh, respiratory droplets. Um, and from the infected um, individuals that can reach and uh, go through our mouth or nose or eyes. Um, these are the most um, uh, dominant ways in which it gets through uh, to the through the person. Uh, and ACE2 receptors are actually um, expressed in these organs as well. And um, of course, airborne transmission is a big thing now. Um, so um, it is believed that uh, these stay in the air for at least 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and so, so for example, if a person is um, infected and is walking without a mask and uh, just crossed your uh, street and uh, you just take a stroll after five, 10 minutes, there's a possibility that those are still going to be in the air. So airborne transmission is a big thing. And then fomite transmission is uh, from contaminated surfaces. So it's believed that these can actually stay on surfaces for at least 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then feces and urine are also other modes of transmission of these. And uh, I'm sure Dr. Chutkin is going to talk about that a little later. Um, and um, Dr. Fauci actually, um, just a couple of days ago, um, just said, uh, gave up a statistics that it's 45 to 50 percent is actually by asymptomatic transmission. So that's something that there's no control over. So people who um, have the virus um, can still spread it without even knowing that they actually carry the virus. Um, and then there's also talk about transmission via sex, but although there has been absolutely no studies out there, uh, but they found um, the virus in the semen as well. Um, so there are lots of different ways that it can actually be transmitted and uh, we are still trying to study how best to um, take care of this. Of course, my one, only one thing that I think we all can agree on is um, in the absence of a vaccine, the best way to protect is a mask um, and that can actually protect more than 70% of the transmission rates. So Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chutkin, <clears throat> we are all familiar with common symptoms of COVID, such as fever and shortness of breath. 
Are there gastrointestinal symptoms of COVID infection that we should be on the lookout for? There absolutely are. And again, Dr. Vassad even touched on some of those, but SARS-CoV-2 has been isolated from the fecal stream. And in fact, if we look at the early data from Wuhan, China, we see that 47% of patients had both respiratory and GI symptoms. 41% had respiratory symptoms alone. So it was actually more common from that early data for people to have a combination of GI and respiratory symptoms. You might be wondering what sorts of GI symptoms, diarrhea, loss of appetite, and nausea are the, the most common, those three, but abdominal pain and vomiting have also been reported. And in the US data, it seems to be about one third of patients who report GI symptoms in association with respiratory symptoms. GI symptoms alone without any respiratory symptoms are pretty unusual, less than 3% in most of the studies, but the combination of GI and respiratory symptoms is very common. And it's important to note that SARS-CoV-2 may remain detectable in feces long after it's negative from a nasopharyngeal swab. And that seems to be a marker also for people with more severe disease. So people who present with gastrointestinal symptoms, usually again in association with respiratory symptoms, can clear the virus from their nasopharyngeal secretions, but it can still be present in the fecal stream for weeks after. And this leads to the big question about oral fecal transmission. So far, we haven't seen any documented cases. And of course, the things other than people who work in a laboratory with fecal samples, the way that would happen would typically be poor sanitation or poor hygiene practices or contamination with food. If you are a restaurant worker, for example, and you're not washing your hands carefully after you use a bathroom. There was one report from China of an outbreak in an apartment complex where there was a leak in the sewage pipes and so some of the fecal effluent was aerosolized, if you will, throughout the apartment complex, and they were able to trace that back. But here, there's, you know, I know a lot of my patients have been concerned about public restrooms and so on. And again, as Dr. Vassar even said, right now, we know the most effective way to protect ourselves is wearing a mask. And I would add to that hand washing, particularly when using a public bathroom, et cetera. But we don't think the so-called fecal plume which is the fact that virus may be released after flushing, we, we have not found that that as of date, as of today, that that seems to be a significant contribution to how the virus is transmitted. But again, it is important to keep, uh, keep these GI symptoms top of mind. So that would again be diarrhea, loss of appetite and nausea. Thank you. Dr. Michelle. Are people with autoimmune disorders or immune deficiencies at higher risk of COVID? And what does this tell us about the immune system? Um, so again, I wanna to say too, at the beginning, this is a evolving situation. We don't have a full picture of you know, conditions, but um, I believe CDC has released guidance um, that those living with particularly immunodeficiency from uh, organ transplants, um, or those living with uh, obesity or type 2 diabetes are particularly high risk uh, for severe COVID. Um, I think the data is a little less clear, although these folks are still at high risk, uh, people living with HIV, those using corticosteroids, um, or those living with uh, asthma, hypertension, et cetera. Um, more of my research focuses on those living with HIV, and it does seem with folks uh, with a lower CD4 count, um, or those, potentially those uh, not on highly effective uh, antiretroviral therapy or at higher risk of severe COVID. Um, but these are complicated studies to do because a lot of it's epidemiological, right? And um, living with HIV can be associated with uh, uh, an increased risk for other comorbidities that might put you at additional risk. Um, so it, it's complicated, I think. Um, but I think it is interesting that, uh, you know, at different levels, a compromised immunity, whether it's through um, immunodeficiency or chronic immune activation can be associated with COVID severity. Um, and I think this basically just shows us how complex the immune response uh, can be and how balanced it really needs to be uh, when we're fighting off infection. Um, I'm sure as many of you know, uh, severe COVID disease can sometimes be associated with um, what's called a, a cytokine storm, essentially just have an overwhelming amount of uh, particularly IL-6, um, but some other chemokines and cytokines. Um, particularly, you know, it, like in the lung, and it can draw a lot of uh, neutrophils uh, into the tissue and cause a lot of uh, destruction. 
Now, these cytokines and chemokines are typically part of a healthy immune response. Um, nearly all of our body cells have a way of sensing viral pathogens um, through different receptors, um, and our cells essentially transfer this information to, to key immune cells, and then these immune cells start an immune response. And this communication is done through cytokines and chemokines. Um, yeah, and massive activation of immune cells um, can also be an issue for our immune response, particularly non-specifically. Um, if you think about when you get a cut or a bug bite, uh, very quickly afterwards, you know, it'll get red and itchy and kind of inflamed, and, and that's kind of that non-specific response. It's not responding directly to uh, any particular pathogen that might be present, but it's just kind of you know, creating a lot of inflammation at the site. Um, and the, our immune response really relies on bringing that back down to normal. Um, to bring this back to the gut a little bit, um, I mentioned these immune responses happening in the lung, but it seems that they could be happening in the gut as well, uh, which makes sense uh, since we have these two receptors uh, there as well. There may be viral presence as we, as we talked about. Um, and SARS-CoV-2 can, can trigger inflammatory responses in the gut, it seems like, um, particularly this influx of neutrophils um, and yeah, there's evidence um, that SARS-CoV-2 can, can avoid some of the early immune response um, and essentially kind of knock down some of our, our early response. So yeah, the complicated virus. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Pichon. Dr. Sudovin, what are the cellular manifestations of COVID infections, specifically protein-protein interactions, which could affect the normal physiology of cell functions? Yes, as um, Kate uh, just said, it's it's actually a very complex virus. Um, we are into it for almost eight months, and the whole world is working on this, and we are still trying to learn something new every single day. Uh, but one thing we have learned in the last eight months is that it can pretty much affect all organs from head to toe opening uh, doors to systems medicine approaches uh, to understand this virus. Um, so COVID-19 inf infects airway and elementary epithelial cells that express ACE2. And the local mucosal infection leads to the initial symptom symptoms that we see like fever, shortness of breath, and uh, gastrointestinal distress. And this is an an analogous to the other viruses that we've seen in the past like SARS and MERS. But there's a very crucial difference between those and COVID-19. And in fact, it almost seems like an unrecognized feature in the other coronaviruses that we've seen so far. And the difference is, I think, that COVID has a second phase. So during the second phase of infection, what it does is it crosses the epithelial basement membrane and spreads as a viremia. And to infect systemic, systemic endothelial cells that express ACE2, and co-receptors that are present in the kidney, lungs, and uh, peripheral vasculature. Um, and also we have seen uh, from results of autopsies, this is pretty much how they learned uh, that uh, looking at autopsies, they found there was lots of thromboembolism. That is almost, it seems like a disease of the blood vessels. Um, and so, uh, so it's a very complex thing and lots of different uh, proteins and pathways are implicated in uh, starting from the initial um, binding to ACE2 leading to all the systemic infections and the um, it becomes more complex in people with underlying conditions uh, like uh, Kate explained and um, Robin explained earlier so it becomes a very complex disease and uh, lots of different pathways are being implicated for example vitamin D vitamin B uh, pathways are very crucial and this ties back to the microbiome because vitamin B uh, is very important for the uh, stability of the gut um, and also some of the nutrients that we get are actually produced by the bacteria in the gut and so when all of this is affected so again it brings back to the role of microbiome in this whole uh, COVID infections so long story short I think there's a lot of different pathways lot, lots of different proteins are in, implicated in uh, the complexity and we have identified quite a few too, but we're still far away from putting the whole thing to um, and solving the piece of the puzzle of what causes what. So again, I would end with saying that it's very complex and we are still trying to identify things. Thank you. Dr. Chutkin, are there medications that may place individuals at higher risk of contracting COVID? And is there any evidence of microbial changes in COVID patients? 
I'm going to start, Doug, with the second part of that question first, because it follows very well from what Sona was saying. When I read these reports of perfectly healthy people dropping dead uh, from COVID, of course, sometimes that is a case, and everybody who dies from this virus is a tragedy for sure. But I'm, I'm often intrigued by some of the things that may not be as obvious. So when we think about comorbidities, we think about lung disease and heart disease, obesity, diabetes, et cetera. But a disordered microbiome, what we consider dysbiosis, is a very significant risk factor, not just for autoimmune disease, but for infection also. And there are lots of factors, as Kate described in her introductory comments, there are lots of factors that can affect that diet, medications, et cetera. So here you start to see the interplay between diet and medications and the host immune system. And a, a common example of that would be, for example, one of the medications that is a major risk factor, which are steroids. When people suppress the immune system with a steroid, their risk of infection goes up. And that can be bacterial, viral, and fungal infections for some of these immunosuppressive drugs. So the two classes that come to mind are biologics. And in my world of gastroenterology, those are the anti-TNF drugs that we see advertised on television for a wider and wider range of use now from the first, from two decades ago when they were really first introduced. So they were typically reserved for sicker patients with autoimmune disease, with diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. But now we see them being used more broadly for mild psoriasis, asthma, et cetera. And so the problem is we have large groups of people who are on these drugs who under normal circumstances, yes, the drugs confer a risk. And again, that's an increased risk of infection and in some cases malignancy, but the risk is really, the risk is really significantly greater now. And again, in my world of inflammatory bowel disease, there is a registry that's been started called IBD Secure to report on patients with inflammatory bowel disease, also on biologics, how they've been doing with COVID. And I'm happy to say that I, I do have some patients in my practice who've done very well, some patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis who've had the disease. But I also just want to make the political statement that that registry is supported by all the pharmaceutical companies that make those drugs. And so there's a huge question mark in my mind as to really the legitimacy of that information. Because if you look on the website for any biologic, the first thing you see in bold letters is this drug does increase the risk of infection, bacterial, viral, and fungal. So again, we are amassing data. It's important to know what some of these large study results will show. But for right now, what I'd like to say, people who are on steroids, if you are on a high dose steroid, which is greater than, considered greater than 20 milligrams a day if, if prednisone, if you have been on the steroid for more than three months, that's considered high risk. And so even if you can't completely get off the steroid, if you can drop the dose down to under 20 milligrams, or you can shorten the duration of the time that you're on the steroid, that's very helpful in terms of mitigating your risk. The third drug I'd like to mention are the acid blocking drugs, proton pump inhibitors. Many of you might have seen that study published in July in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. I think it made headlines in other medical journals such as the New York Times. Um, but that study was a population-based online survey of about 55,000 people. And they looked at the question whether there was an increased risk of contracting COVID in people who are taking acid blocking drugs. And again, they found that people who are on these drugs long term, meaning several months, not just taking it for a week or two, did indeed have a significantly increased risk, somewhere between two and three times higher, depending on how much you were taking, than the general population, which is really significant. It makes perfect sense because we know that stomach acid is one of our main defenses against infection, along with the skin and our mucous membranes. And we've known for decades that these drugs increase the risk of other enteric infections like C. diff and salmonella, et cetera. So it's not a surprise, but again, this is something that the average person out there can probably do with, with the help of their doctor if they're on a proton pump inhibitor is to think about getting off and seeing what other modalities might be effective in, in treating whatever the PPI was being used to treat. Thank you. Dr. Michelle, Dr. Sudovan talked to us about microbial populations that shift with COVID. How could shifts in gut microbial populations end up affecting COVID acquisition or progression? 
Um, yeah, so it's it's pretty generally accepted that gut dysbiosis can be associated with, uh, say, increased intestinal permeability, permeability um, and detoxin concentrations in blood, um, causing more uh, dispersed inflammation in the body. Um, there's some evidence that this occurs with uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, with studies um, that uh, GI disorders and COVID patients associated with worse outcomes that I think, is, as Robin mentioned, um, and this might contribute to the cytokine storm and, and general inflammation, uh, as we mentioned before. Um, there's also a known relationship between uh, gut microbes in the lungs called the gut-lung axis. Um, you may have heard of the gut-brain axis. Um, there are many different axes, uh, but essentially alterations to the gut microbiome through drugs, diet, you know, every disease, as, as we've mentioned, um, is associated with altered immunity in the lungs. Um, for instance, the gut microbiome uh, associates with COPD, uh, asthma, um, and it's thought that this relationship can occur, occur in part through metabolic pro products, sorry, of bacterial fer uh, fermentation of fibers, um, and those are called uh, short chain fatty acids. Um, and just broadly, um, you know, kind of, there's a lot of crosstalk between the microbiome and uh, immunity and regulation. Um, and particularly, bringing it back to the gut for a second too, um, uh, maintenance of homeostasis is really important there and induction of what are called T regulatory cells that kind of, as it sounds, play a role in uh, regulation of immune response. Um, so yeah, that, that might be a potential uh, direct and indirect mechanisms. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. Dr. Chuckin, we've been hearing a lot of, about people who recover from the acute illness, who, who we hear a lot about people with COVID who recover from the acute illness, but are left with chronic lingering symptoms. Can you tell us more about that? Sure, I think you're referring to what we've come to call long hauler syndrome and people who are not recovering. So if you contrast the flu, for example, Doug, at about two weeks out from contracting classic influenza, 90% of people are typically recovered and back to baseline. The number seems far lower for COVID. CDC data of about 270 patients showed that two weeks after hospitalization with COVID, the majority of them were still not at their baseline. And I think it speaks to the systemic effects of this virus that Kate and Sona have alluded to and how much we still don't know. But what we do know is that there is definitely a cohort of people who seem to continue to have symptoms, not just weeks, but even months after infection. There are three main categories for this long hauler syndrome that seem to be identified. One is dysautonomia, and that is primarily going to affect things like blood pressure, respiratory rate, heart rate, where people might for example, get dizzy, sitting up suddenly, and have these significant alterations and perturbations in their blood pressure and heart rate. Another category is sort of post-exertional malaise, where even mild exercise or mild exertion, like going up a flight of stairs, can trigger significant symptoms. And then the third really falls into the category of a sort of chronic fatigue syndrome category. Now, of course, there are literally dozens of other symptoms from tremors and headaches to all kinds of things that people have described, but these seem to be the three main ones. The people who are affected seem to be primarily women with an average age of around 45. And I think there's a lot of debate right now. I think many people suffering from long hauler syndrome have felt like the medical community is gaslighting them, not taking the symptoms seriously. Many of these symptoms are hard to sort of objectively identify and prove. And um, there's conflicting issues of people sometimes who may have other reasons to claim long-term disability from this. So it's a really fraught area, but I think we have very convincing evidence that long hauler syndrome is real and it definitely needs to be explored and researched. And in many ways, Doug, it's not that dissimilar from things like post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome, where we know that after an infectious episode, be it viral, bacterial, or fungal, many people go on to develop classic irritable bowel syndrome with gastrointestinal symptoms that last for years. So I think there's a real corollary between something like post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome and post-COVID long hauler syndrome. And as we have a longer trajectory from time of infection to potential recovery, I think we'll start to learn more about this. Thank you. Dr. Sudovan, 
Can you update us on the latest clinical trials and treatments for COVID? Yes. Um, well, it's a blessing that the whole world has actually been working on this for the last um, nonstop for eight months. Uh, as per clinicaltrials.gov, there are about um, 1,800 uh, trials and studies right now uh, ongoing uh, where they're actually recruiting uh, patients right now. And in addition to that, there are another 850 trials that are not recruiting yet, but will start. Um, so now there are lots and lots of um, interesting data that's coming out and uh, I'm very optimistic that we will get something uh, and thanks to the whole methodology of drug repurposing. Um, that's why we're able to very quickly uh, come up with these drugs and put them in into the trials. Um, so for those of you not, not familiar with drug repurposing, it is just um, using an FDA approved drug that was approved for some other condition uh, and that can be tried for COVID. For example, hydroxychloroquine, which actually has made the headlines and it's still talked about a lot, is one of those drugs, uh, but unfortunately it's not panned out. Remdesivir uh, we, is again one of those drugs that was actually approved for Ebola um, and that's being tried right now. But in addition, um, I keep looking at this every single day to see whether something is coming, going to come out or not. So there are a couple of drugs that have come out recently or at least in their last uh, stages, um, are these um, anti-inflammatory um, drugs uh, that have been approved for um, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it's called Epilomod. Um, it's one of those, uh, I, everyone is thinking that that will be very promising. So there are quite a few of those uh, that are almost um, in the last phases. Um, and of course, in addition to all of these, there are lots of vaccine trials that everybody is seeing in the news. Uh, hopefully something will pan out. Thank you. Now let's take questions from the audience. <clears throat> Dr. Sudovin, what is the difference between functional medicine and systemic medicine, which you mentioned? So system, systemic, uh, systems medicine is pretty much looking at uh, the person as a whole. Uh, so, for example, if a person has uh, type 2 diabetes, it's not uh, just giving them metformin and uh, be done with it, but then taking metformin is actually going to uh, lead to lots of other side effects. So, pretty much looking at their other conditions, looking at lots of other parameters, and then looking them as a whole. So, the whole concept of cura personalis, so looking at the person as a whole. So functional medicine is more um, biochemical and at the cellular level, what is happening. So we actually come up with the whole concept of systems medicine and personalize, personalization of the treatment based on functional uh, attributes that we are seeing. And again, I want to emphasize one size does not fit all. So we have to um, look at each person individually um, and then um, see what works best for them. Excellent, thank you. This is for, for all the panelists. Can you share the best ways of practicing good microbiome health? I'm happy to start with that one. I like to sum it up in three simple words, dirt, sweat, and vegetables. But in all seriousness, diet is probably the largest contributor in terms of controllable factors. And what are the things that we need to eat for a healthy microbiome? indigestible plant fiber, poorly digestible plant fiber. So that would be things like celery and onions, garlic, leeks, all that stringy fiber. Um, what we call max, microbiota accessible carbohydrates, which would include oats and different kinds of beans are also really important. When we look at communities around the world that have really healthy microbiomes, those tend to be the foods that we see as well as limiting processed foods, uh, limiting refined sugar, alcohol, uh, large amounts of animal protein and fat. So really a primarily plant-based or plant-powered, if you will, diet that's high in unprocessed fiber seems to be very healthy. Exposure to nature is also important because we get most of our microbes at birth, but we continue to acquire them from the soil. So spending time in nature is important and also thinking about where the food you're eating came from. Was it grown in microbially rich soil or was it sort of assembled in a factory somewhere? That's another important factor. And then of course, avoiding unnecessary medications that can be destructive to the microbiome with antibiotics being at the top of the list, followed closely by some of the other drugs we talked about, 
acid blocking drugs, steroids, et cetera. So I, I like to think of it in terms of remove, replace, restore. Remove, are there things in your medicine cabinet that are not serving you that are also not necessary that you can get rid of? Um, restore is how can you sort of get out into nature and get closer to the soil? And then replace is really the diet. Uh, how can you increase the amount of indigestible plant fiber so that you can increase the healthy species? For example, bacteria like Fecalobacterium prosnitzii, the most prevalent bacteria in vegans that we know is protective against cardiometabolic disease, colon cancer, et cetera. Thank you. To all the panelists. Are there specific behaviors and precautions that lupus patients should do or take beyond the general ones already mentioned to protect themselves from COVID-19? I think I... Um... Rheumatologist, full disclosure, I'm a gastroenterologist, but as many of you know, lupus does pose significant risks to the kidneys of kidney disease. And kidney disease seems to be an important comorbidity for COVID along with some of the other things we talked about like heart disease and lung disease. So if you're a lupus patient who already has kidney disease and might even be on dialysis, you really need to take extra precautions and you should talk to your nephrologist about what those might look like. If you're a lupus patient who isn't aware of kidney disease, that might be something just to check and make sure to have your kidney function checked and make sure that you do have kidney function that's within normal limits. And if not, to, to see if there are additional precautions, which would have more to do with um, harboring at home and things like that, limiting interaction with large crowds and so on. But just the additional precautions we use for people who are at increased risk. And then of course I'd mentioned steroids, trying to get down to a lower dose of steroids if you are on a drug like that. Those are all things that can be helpful. Thank you. For Dr. Michelle, can you repeat what types of compromised immune illnesses which are more likely to be impacted by COVID-19? Uh, sure, so this, is, this comes from CDC guidance. Um, and the, I think folks all, of the ones I mentioned are, are folks who should really, you know, be taking a lot of precautions, um, wearing masks, et cetera. Um, the higher risk uh, per CDC is for uh, folks who uh, are immunocompromised from solid organ transplants um, and folks um, uh, living with cancer, um, living with uh, type 2 diabetes, obesity um, are at particularly high risk. Um, but, you know, of course, folks with hypertension, um, other uh, living with HIV um, or or other um, uh, conditions should should you know are, I you know they are definitely still at risk um, and uh, maybe not at highest risk but still at risk um, and again I am not an MD so I don't want to do anything prescriptive um, but you know it, and we should all be taking um, as many precautions as we can minimizing uh, uh, transmission and uh, preserving our health, so. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. Dr. Masudovin, can somebody who has recovered from COVID and presumably has antibodies still be a vector of transmission? In other words, if they are exposed to COVID again and their antibodies are effectively fighting it, can they transmit COVID to others during this process? Uh, yeah, so there is uh, data that, very little data that is coming out and it's actually this confusing data that is coming out. So there are different uh, categories of this. So there are uh, people who have been infected, say about six months ago, um, and they don't have antibodies anymore. And they didn't even know that they actually had, um, you know, they had antibodies or not. That is, that's again, a very confusing thing. So say that a person who's had COVID and tested positive for um, COVID antibodies, and they come down with uh, COVID again. And so, um, they definitely can transmit that, uh, but then it's contradicting. Antibodies are supposed to protect you from the infection again, but now we are learning that these antibodies actually are not that protective for everyone. So there are cases where they do have, and they've been infected the second time. And in fact, I know only of a couple of cases, uh, there's not much of literature on it, where it's actually been fatal the second time. 
Um, so I'm just going to uh, see if um, Dr. Chutkin, as a physician, has anything more to add more to um, uh, to this. I think you're exactly right with your comments, Sona. We we really don't know, and uh, we have, as you said, seen cases where antibodies are not protective against transmitting. The question of reinfection is also something that there's a lot of interest in. And to also sort of add to the confusion, it depends on what sort of, you know, who is doing the antibody testing, et cetera. There are various levels of accuracy. Um, if we look at something like convalescent plasma, we thought that that was going to be much more helpful than it was in terms of, you know, using these antibodies to create immunity in, in unexposed and uninfected people. And that has not seemed to be the case. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done. And I know that some of the immunologists are hard at work on this and we should have some more answers soon. Thank you. So I just want to add uh, one more point to um, uh, Robbins uh, that it all depends on the viral load. Um, so a lot of people who we are talking about a, being asymptomatic actually carry the virus, but they are not getting uh, the symptoms. They're not coming down with the symptoms because the load of the virus is actually low enough that they're not able to see any symptoms, but they still can infect other people. And so it all boils down to the virus load, uh, how, how much viruses that they're carrying, but they definitely can infect other people. Thank you. Dr. Chutkin, how does food security impact minority communities and gut health? And what are two things we can do to strengthen outcomes? That's such a great question. And particularly now that we're dealing with a double whammy of dealing with COVID and really recognizing all the racial and social injustice in our country, because we know that there is a direct link between many of these conditions that we've talked about that are deadly on their own and combined with a pandemic are really just devastatingly deadly. We know that there's an increased prevalence of diseases like hypertension, diabetes, and obesity in our minority populations. And we also know, as whoever's asking this very good question pointed out, that food insecurity is a major issue in these populations. I think we really have to look at uh, make prevention a really important aspect of our public health measures, not just looking at, yes, it's important to make sure that more minorities are included in the vaccine trials, but it's also really important to make sure that the basic work for our minority populations are done, which is access to not just decent healthcare, but access to really healthy food, access to microbiome enhancing foods. And so you really can't separate this issue of minorities living in food deserts and not having access to proper nutrition, to then developing diseases, to then being at increased risk for COVID. It's all related. And then when you add into that mix the fact that a, the fact that a disproportionate number of minorities in this country are essential workers, it's not surprising that minorities are dying in record numbers and in really disproportionate numbers. And so again, I think this has to be a really combined tactic of not just how can we get things like vaccines and medications, but how can we improve general nutrition in these populations. There are some really terrific people working in this area of food insecurity, both in DC and nationally. And I hope they'll really be able to make that connection between COVID and really make it a priority for our public health system. Thank you, Dr. Chakti. We are almost at time. We have one more question. This is to all the panelists. Can the panelists share their thoughts on daily vitamins or supplements as a way to build immunity? Um, specifically looking at probiotics in the diet, as well as kombucha. Dr. Michelle, would you like to start off answering that question? Uh, I will have to say again, I am not an MD. Uh, I don't want to potentially wade into anything that's uh, prescriptive. And, um, you know, I think we also have to deal with, you know, uh, I've seen studies that, that supplements uh, over the counter are not always, you know, what what we think they are uh, within them. So uh, I I think um, I think as Robin has pointed out, and and I don't want to put words there, um, but I think a diet, a healthy diet, uh, exercise, getting good sleep, you know, reducing your stress, these things are part of your your whole being and your health as a whole. Um, we're increasingly learning how how stress can really affect uh, your body. And health, um, and I think um, thinking about it a little more holistically um, can 
you know, kind of work at uh, improving your health. So that's what I'll say. And I'll, I'll defer to uh, Robin uh, for anything more specific that she's more knowledgeable about. There's, there's been a, thank you for that, Kate. There's been a lot of interest in vitamin D and there've been some studies from Singapore and other countries suggesting that people with low vitamin D levels have a worse outcome for COVID. And while that is a case or is an association, a couple things, some of those studies didn't take into account all the other comorbidities that could have affected that. So people with lower vitamin D levels are also more likely to have some of these other diseases that the studies didn't necessarily account for. But the bigger issue is that even though there is a correlation between and when I say low vitamin D levels, I don't mean low normal, I mean below normal. So we're talking a below typically 32 or in some studies, 25 micrograms. So levels, for example, in the teens or low 20s might be correlated, but there is also no evidence that taking vitamin D, particularly if you have a normal vitamin D level, will do anything other than potentially create vitamin D toxicity, which is a real problem. So there is zero scientific recommendation to take a vitamin D supplement unless you are deficient. If you are truly deficient, there's evidence that repleting, having a, a normal vitamin D level is healthy for good health in general. We have not shown that repleting vitamin D if you're deficient decreases your risk for COVID, but it's a good idea. But again, I'll repeat, no evidence that if you have a normal level, even if that's low normal, that you should take vitamin D. Other things that have been talked about, including vitamin C and zinc, again, no evidence that they're helpful for COVID. So my biggest piece of advice really is some of the basic things, which is diet, stress, sleep, exercise. Those will take you a long way. And as Kate said, often when you're taking a supplement, this is an unregulated market. You have no idea what's actually in it. You could be taking something that could be affecting your liver or kidneys. These are some of the main organs of detoxification and putting unnecessary stress on your body. So really don't recommend taking something that you've you know, seen advertised on the internet, et cetera, in the absence of good scientific guidelines. So if something's working, we should be hearing from the CDC. Dr. Sudovic, do you have any uh, quick comments on that, that question before we wrap up? Yes, am I, uh, I agree with uh, Kate and uh, Robin. So I think it's better to supplement yourself with food and uh, you know any uh, foods that are rich in vitamins to go na the natural way than actually taking something from the uh, over the counter, especially vitamin D, as Dr. Chatkin actually said, that um, uh, it's actually very tricky because vitamin D, although it's called a vitamin, is actually not a vitamin, it's a hormone. And so it regulates lots of different things. And so uh, before you start putting yourself on vitamin D, I think you should uh, talk to your physician and test the levels that you have. And if it's normal, there's nothing it's going to do by taking more vitamin D, except it might harm you. Um, just that's what the studies have shown. So um, going natural is the best way. Take a lot of turmeric, that, is what, that works. And com kombucha, anybody have uh, comments on kombucha? Kombucha is healthier than soda. That's um, what I will say, but kombucha has no health benefits when it comes to, has no demonstrated scientific benefits when it comes to COVID or specifically for improving the microbiome. It's a healthy alternative to soda. And I don't think it's harmful, but the idea that drinking kombucha can boost your immune system is an unproven claim. Thank you. And with that, we are at time. Um, I would like to thank our panelists for a wonderful, engaging, and informative session. Thank you all so much. And with that, we'll turn it back over to Kelly for a few last closing words. Thanks again. Thank you, Doug. Thank you again, uh, Douglas, Robin, Kate, and Sona for taking the time to have this discussion with our community. Thank you all for joining us today and taking part in the conversation please look out for our follow-up email which will include more information on upcoming programs as well as a feedback survey and link to today's recording also look out for the fall edition of georgetown health magazine all about gut health coming out in october at alumni.georgetown.edu thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your day thank you <laughs>